appreciate you all taking time with us. This is the Weathering the Storm online forum for Mystic business owners. And we have um, currently about uh, 22 folks on the line, which is really great. I know we have some local business owners. We have um, some representatives of local partner groups. Um, I do want to kick it off first by handing it over to Bruce Flax, who is the president of the Greater Mystic Chamber of Commerce. And then after Bruce goes, I'll introduce myself and then um, I'll try to do a quick round of introductions of all the participants. All, all right, right, so with that. Thank you, Megan. Thanks. Um, and thank you everybody for joining today. I, you know, the Greater Mystic Chamber of Commerce um, is always interested in um, challenges that businesses face and helping them to resolve those challenges and, and both short-term and long-term. And uh, when Megan and the town came to us with regards to this particular uh, forum, um, we were on board from the beginning. It's super important about, um, you know, what what the um, environment and what, what weather-related impacts are going to happen. We've seen it happen with storms in the past down here in Mystic um, for the last, since I've been here, the last 25 years. And um, there are, uh, you know, challenges that business owners face and the best way to understand those challenges is to get together with the business owners. So I appreciate uh, Megan and the town um, putting this together. And um, and uh, like I said, we're we're uh, very happy to be a part of it and thankful that we were included. So thank you. Thanks, Megan. Absolutely. Thank you. It was really great to have the Chamber's support on this. Um, I really appreciate you being all in to help us um, have this important discussion. Um, so with that, for those who don't know me, uh, this is my information. I am Megan Granado. I work for the town of Groton. I am the town sustainability and resilience manager. Um, and then I have a number of colleagues on the call this morning as well. Um, so I'll kind of do their introductions for them. We have uh, John Reiner, who is the director of the Office of Planning and Development Services. We have uh, Paige Bronk, who is our head of economic development. We have Kevin Fitzgerald, who works with Paige and uh, administers our ARPA funding, American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, we have Lauren Post, who's helping us with Zoom support and also works on the economic development team. Um, and I think, oh, and we have Dave Prescott, who does uh, planning work for us and knows a ton about coastal flood issues. So um, you'll hear folks kind of on our end chime in during the discussion portion. Um, and quickly, just since we don't have a, a good way of seeing each other, let me run down the participant list. And if folks want to come very briefly off mute, we don't want to spend too much time on introductions. Um, but just saying your name, if you're here representing a local business or a group. Um, that would be great. And um, these are not in alphabetical order. So <laughs> just bear with me. I'll call out the names. Uh, the first is Zell Stever. Um, thank you, Megan. I'm, I'm listing. Um, I haven't got uh, any uh, ability to deal with the audio or the video or who the participant list is. Yeah, unfortunately that's not going to be possible this morning just based on how Zoom um, Zoom webinars are, are run. So that's uh, why we're gonna just quickly run through the list of participants. Um, so from Zell, we have also Robert Boris. Hi, good morning. Robert Boris, Chairman of the Economic Development Commission. Glad to be here participating and uh, glad for everyone's effort. Excellent. Thanks so much, Robert. Christine Bradley. Hi, I'm the director of the Mystic and Noank Library, high up on the hill, but happy to be here. Fantastic. Thank you, Christine. Um, then we have Seb and I'm Posiarski. I'm sorry for mispronouncing the last name. It's all good. It happens all the time. Don't worry about it. Seb Kozaricki. Um, I am the social media uh, ambassador for Fat Face Mystic. We aren't, you know, only Mystic based, but since I do everything that has to deal with like networking and social media and event planning, uh, I figured I would hop on and meet everyone and learn some new things. Wonderful. We are thrilled you're here with us. Uh, Don Sargent. Hey, Don, I can't hear you. I see that you're off mute. Uh, 
Okay, I know Don is with Fort Rachel Marina. Um, so we're thrilled that he's on the line with us this morning. Uh, Chris Gassiorek. Hi, good morning. I'm Chris from uh, Mystic Seaport Museum. Uh, shipyard, waterfront, and uh, resilience and all that fun stuff. So great to be here. Fantastic. Thanks, Chris. Good to see you virtually. Uh, Maggie Favretti. Hi, I'm Maggie Favretti, um, first chair director of the Alliance for the Mystic River Watershed. And we invite everyone to uh, join a standing working group on business and resilience in Mystic. Happy Thank to be you. here. Thanks, Maggie. Uh, Eric Ott. Good morning, everybody. I am um, a steering committee member for this study, and I'm a longtime employee of the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. I have a lot of experience uh, over the years dealing with coastal issues um, right along the entire Connecticut coast, as well as inland. So uh, good morning again, everybody. Good morning, Eric. Next, we have Chris Houlihan. Good morning, Megan. Uh, it's Chris Houlihan. I am on the town of Stonington Flood Prevention, Climate Resilience, and Erosion Control Board. What an awful title, but uh, it's uh, it has uh, good intentions, and we've been working diligently and uh, very pleased to be part of this today. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Next, we have Annie Philbrick. This is me. This is Annie Philbrick. I'm the owner of Bank Square Books, um, and that's about all I'm going to say because I'm actually driving. So ah, okay. happy to be here. Okay. Thanks Bye. so much for squeezing us in, even though you're in the car. Yeah, well, it's okay. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, next up, we have Frank Bolin. Yes, good morning. I'm another member of the steering committee for the downtown study. And uh, I'm a uh, professor emeritus of uh, oceanography at the University of Connecticut, a longtime resident of Mystic. And uh, happy to be here. Glad to see so many folks uh, participating in this. Thanks, Frank. Next up, we have Rick Newton. Hi, I'm uh, the chair of the Stonington Climate Change Task Force. Thanks, Rick. Um, and then I believe last but not least is Jim O'Donnell. Uh, I guess I'm lost. I'm, Jim, I'm a professor of marine sciences at the University of Connecticut, and I'm the executive director of the Connecticut Institute for Resilience and Climate Adaptation. I live in Newark, and I've been the uh, co-chair and chair of the Science Advisory Committee to the Governor's Council on Climate Change for the last couple of years. Excellent. Thanks so much for joining us, Jim. Okay, so from here, I'm gonna launch into a couple of slides. Um, and this is gonna be fairly interactive as much as we can make a Zoom um, and having everyone virtual. I'm gonna present a few slides. We'll take a break for conversation, present a couple more slides and finish up with a little bit more conversation at the end. Um, and so I have briefly the session goals, you know, really, we want to hear from those who live uh, and work, uh, you know, business owners in, in, in downtown Mystic about how weather related challenges like flooding, extreme heat and humidity are impacting them and their business's bottom line. So a big part of this is us hearing from you so that we better understand the dynamics of, of what you're what you're dealing with, the things that keep you up at night. Um, and uh, use that to potentially brainstorm some ideas of things that we could do together. So I will give sort of a, a bigger context of this conversation and how it fits into a planning process that we're going through. And then I will also share some resources that can help local businesses as they, they plan to uh, prepare for things like flood events. Um, and we'll end by kind of, like I said, brainstorming ideas for future collaboration. What you won't see in this presentation today is a lot of flood maps, climate predictions. Um, you know, I know a lot of folks have seen those and we certainly have those materials if you're interested, but we know that time is money and we want to keep this very uh, short and sweet um, and uh, really focus the conversation on what we can all proactively do together moving forward. Um, and some of the recommendations that we'll look at today, the resources can help local business owners deal not just with climate related impacts, but other potential disruptions like cybersecurity threats and things of that nature. 
Um, and, you know, we're, we're glad that folks are interested in having this conversation. We're glad that it's folks from both the Groton and the Stonington side all talking about this together. Um, and research has really shown the importance of taking action before uh, these large flood events and things of that nature. Um, there was some research that was done looking at local businesses impacted by Hurricane Harvey and Superstorm Sandy, and they found that those businesses, for every dollar they invested in resilience actions before those events, they actually avoided over four and a half dollars of losses. Um, so, you know, it, it can be hard when businesses are dealing with everything just to get through the day to day to add yet another thing on top. Um, but we're hoping that we can provide some resources and look at potential next steps that ease that burden and help local businesses be able to do this kind of preparatory work. So like I said, I'm gonna start by just explaining the bigger context for the discussion on, on the town of Groton side. So we have been working on a downtown mystic resiliency and sustainability plan for some time now. The, the red outline shows the study area that we're working in and we've already talked to a number of you about this project. Uh, we're very thankful the funding for this project came from National Fish and Wildlife Foundation through the Long Island Sound Futures Fund grant without which we would not be able to do the work. Um, and this, in a nutshell, is what the project is all about, right? We are trying to understand in downtown Mystic the impacts of flooding, um, both coastal and the flooding that we get when our stormwater systems get overwhelmed from these huge rainstorm events, as well as uh, extreme heat and humidity, and really understand how it's impacting um, downtown Mystic, the people that live and work there, our infrastructure there, um, some of our systems, um, and so really taking kind of a, a big holistic look at, at those impacts. And part of that, as you can imagine, is doing a lot of looking at geospatial layers and maps and climate predictions. But just as important are the conversations that we're having with people throughout this process. So at the beginning of the project, the consultant team and I went out and went door to door knocking and, and talking to people about their experience with, with flooding, primarily aspects of their business or their home that made those buildings more susceptible to flooding. If they own the property back during Superstorm Sandy, uh, what that, you know, what, what they experienced then, really trying to understand and ground truth the information that we're seeing from the maps, right? Making sure that we, we have a good understanding um, on the ground of how people are living with these hazards. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're also doing stuff online. We have lots of materials, of course. Um, but the, the conversations that we had added a lot of more in-depth understanding of the dynamics of these things. And in the future slides, I have a couple of kind of case studies, things that we heard from talking to people during those conversations. And we are at the point now that we're working with our steering committee to develop priority actions. So now that we understand, okay, here's how flooding and heat are impacting this area, what are we gonna do about it? Um, and so the brainstorming that we'll be doing in this session is going to help us develop that, that list and the recommendations of things that we could be doing to help support the business community. So again, we're really appreciative of folks um, sharing the time to have the conversation with us this morning. Um, and so talking about some of the experiences uh, that uh, folks working at the businesses shared with us, um, and I, I know you're driving, um, but I'll ask you to maybe chime in here because we spoke with one of your managers at Bank Square Books about the experience that you all went through with Superstorm Sandy um, and the needing to move inventory. And, you know, I understand you had about a foot of water in your store and then you were down power for an extended period of time. So unable to dry out carpets. Um, and, you know, that led to to essentially being shut down for about two weeks, as I understand it. Um, well, is there it, was longer than, it was longer than that. It was three weeks. Three weeks. Um, and it basically, yeah, what happened was because the storm, my understanding, because the storm drains couldn't handle the storm surge, that the water just came into the store um through the through the walls and through under the doors and so we actually had to replace the entire floor and cut the walls up about three feet and remove everything and then replace the insulation and all the sheetrock because they were wet because we didn't have any power and we couldn't get a generator we couldn't dry anything out and so 
the first day we the, the apartment upstairs just happened to be empty um sort of serendipitously so we moved the entire kids section upstairs with with the help of the community we never could have done it without the community and then when i came down the next morning um when it got light out i realized that all the books were beginning to absorb the water that was in the store and so i had to call barnes moving and storage and basically beg them to come Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Annie. You know, that was a really impactful conversation that we had um, doing those field surveys, understanding how it is, you know, these flooding events and these big events can be so catastrophic and all of the impacts and the ones that you might not think about, um, you know, at first, I think people sometimes focus on, okay, the carpets are wet, but for a bookstore, having those books that are in this humid climate um, you know, and, and that being such a, a problem for your inventory and then how you move that volume of inventory, you know, um, that was uh, really helpful for us to understand and hear that experience from, from you all. Um, and thanks for sharing it this morning as well. Something we want to highlight as well, though, and um, has come up a lot in the conversations we've had is that the big events, right, the hurricanes, of course, um, can be really disruptive and really damaging to local business operations. But we're having more and more of these uh, smaller, more frequent flooding events uh, that can also be really disruptive. So I wanted to share some photos to remind everyone what December 23rd of last year looked like. This is outside of Harp and Hound, and you can see all the standing water on Pearl Street. Um, we actually have a photo of someone kayaking down Pearl Street, and here we have some garbage bins that are floating. Uh, we have the Daniel Packer Inn with Water Street um, entirely covered by water. The photo on the right is a Christian Science reading room, um, and you can see that staircase that goes down subgrade uh, has a lot of standing water in it. And you can see from that the rack line um, right below the number five on the door, how much higher that water even had been. Um, and so this was a really, you know, it was kind of a, it wasn't a surprise storm. But I think people were taken aback by the depth of the water um, and how quickly things escalated. And so this is an example of, again, this wasn't a named storm. This wasn't, you know, something that the Weather Channel was predicting out weeks in advance. This is just something that happens that that put a lot of water in our system. And um, I had a really great conversation with the manager at the Mystic Army Navy store. Is I don't think is anyone from the Army Navy store on with us this morning? I don't think so. Um, but they talked about how whenever there's standing water on West Main Street, cars tend to drive through it faster than they should. And that actually causes waves of water um, to come up out of the road and crash against the front of the building. And how over time that was actually eroding the structural integrity of the building. So the front of the building was starting to sink and they had to do a capital project to shore up the front of the building, re-secure it, stop the problem from getting even worse. Um, and you can see the photo on the bottom left. They now have like a little um, storm grate in there. Um, for months, they had sandbags out there because that was essentially the first line of defense they had against the water continuing to make things worse. And so you wouldn't naturally think that that was going to be an impact, um, you know, cars creating waves of water. Um, but to them, it was really disruptive and it became very problematic. So it kind of shows the, the dynamics that these smaller events can still have in terms of our infrastructure. And with that, we want to take a pause to hear from you. So we would love if folks felt comfortable um, coming off mute. If not, you might be able to put some comments and I think we have a Q&A box um, to share some thoughts and some experiences of, of what they've experienced uh, with flooding in downtown Mystic. We're also curious about the dynamic of extreme heat, um, you know, whether extreme heat you know, really hot and humid days, do you see less foot traffic or conversely, are more people driven into the stores because you have air conditioning? You know, just would love to hear what, what you're seeing and you're experiencing.
Who's going to be the brave person? Seb, thank you. Yeah, I'll go first. Honestly, a lot of the problems we see, we are in the uh, the new Central Hall building, I believe is the, the title of it. Um, so it's, we haven't had any real structural issues, but we do definitely see like sharply decreased foot tra traffic during periods of extreme heat or rain or cold or flooding. There's barely anyone on the street. Thank you for sharing that with us. Oh, what, what building were you talking about? The building, it, it was completed in 2019. Um, it's, if you're like right next to the ice cream store. Yeah, the Central Hall building, Seb said. Central Hall. Okay, I was correct. Yeah, you were. <laughs> and do you see, I'm curious, Seb, do you see a difference between, you know, you said when it rains out, so it's not taking these kind of like really big storms, but even smaller scale flooding, are you seeing a lot of disruption in terms of the folks out and about probably because they're having a hard time navigating roads and sidewalks? I'd say so. Um, oh, am I okay? I'd say so. I'd also say parking is a struggle during any of this because people don't want to walk as far, and there's barely any places to put their vehicle that they know it won't get flooded. Yeah. Right. If the streets are all flooded too, um, finding parking on a higher ground is even more on a premium. Um, and we've we heard from a couple of people that uh you know that actually had damage to their cars because they uh we had one we did a survey in the midpoint of the project and um one of the survey respondents let us know they they lived and worked in downtown mystic and they're parking you know their car during one of these events their car actually had uh damage because of how far up the water came Bruce, I'm curious if you kind of heard anecdotally from any of the folks who are part of the Greater Mystic Chamber of these sorts of things being problems. Yeah, um, thanks, Megan. So uh, a couple of things. One is, you know, I think that the the uh, what you were saying with the smaller weather events, you know, in that December, last December, we had a couple of rainstorms that flooded Mystic River Park and shorted out the Christmas tree and kept it out for uh, quite a long time, and I don't, um, I'm wondering if there are, um, you know, procedures that stores can look at, especially those that are in, uh, prone to flooding, um, to, uh, you know, mitigate the losses or the damage or, um, you know, take the, you know, are there, are there opportunities for um, what you're doing and, and the fine and the grants and things that you're getting to have the sandbags or whatever it might be um on on um on the ready for things like that you know and, and they're stored you know somewhere in town that allows um you know the uh, the the businesses to act quickly um and within a reasonable time frame to to uh, help stop any damages that may occur because the um you know we're seeing more and more i think um not necessarily you know big waves and huge hurricane storms that come in but um, refuses, you know, a lot of rain coming in a short period of time that causes that flooding, and it tends to go down. You know, we've seen like um, in Mystic during events, we'll get a couple of inches of rain that short term flood the streets, and then within an hour or two, it it takes care of itself. But it doesn't; it still doesn't stop the fact that you know damage can happen in that short period because of the amount of rain that we're getting. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and that's a great kind of teaser for a little bit later in the conversation. Um, what you suggested, that question of could we stockpile materials um, someplace potentially closer to downtown Mystic um, is something that that's a recommendation we're kind of trying to craft and figure out what that might look like. Um, having those materials on hand that business owners can more easily access, I think could be really, really helpful. 
Um, we also heard a lot from folks about availability of sump pumps, right? Not everyone is able to purchase and store a sump, uh, sorry, not a sump pump, a generator, um, sump pumps too. But with generators, you know, not everyone has the space to be able to store a generator. And uh, if a big event comes through, then everyone's trying to get a generator. And so getting your hands on one can be really, really problematic. So if there's somehow a way that we could partner with local businesses to increase the number of generators that are available um, so that folks have better access during these kinds of events, you know, that can make all the difference in getting a local business back up and running. Um, you know, if you have that generator and you can start drying out your store, it's going to help you be able to reopen all that, all that the more quickly. Uh, Maggie, did you have something to weigh in with? Yeah, sure. Um, I have one curiosity question, and uh, and also I'm wondering if <clears throat> if Chris is still on the line because uh, Mystic Seaport has truly extraordinary challenges uh, regarding extreme weather and a whole shoreline and multiple buildings to uh, to protect. Um, so I'd be interested to hear from Chris. Um, also, just for a different perspective um, on these challenges and perhaps different solutions, you know, potential solutions in mind. Uh, but the, my curiosity question is, we had a lot of days last year with very bad air quality. And I know that wasn't specifically part of your study, but I'm curious to see whether any of the business owners on the call found that air quality was also impacting um, foot traffic and whether they feel that all of the cars idling while they're waiting to get across the bridge is contributing to people's asthma, lost work time, anything like that. Oh, that's a great question. Well, this is Chris. I'm here still, and uh, I will jump in about the Mystic Seaport Museum. And uh, I kind of just like what Bruce said, and same thing with uh, whether it's a sudden big rain event or, you know, it almost doesn't seem like we've had a low tide in uh, the last few weeks. But it's, uh, you know, used to be that in the winter there'd be nor'easters and uh, some of the grounds would flood. But uh, starting back 2017, 2018, uh, we started to get floods during the summer months and started to affect business as well as uh, days when sometimes we couldn't open a certain entrance or operate to certain things. So, you know, we've been looking out forward for several years, trying to see what kind of arrangements we can make. And we've been making some small arrangements, but, uh, you know, trying to stay at the forefront of uh, what kind of big changes we can make and connecting with all regional and relevant, relevant things. So uh, happy to join in. Um, across the river as, as much as we can. Thanks so much for that, Chris. Um, I'm curious, Christine, with the library, you know, I've spoke with Jen Mealy, the director of the Groton Public Library about extreme heat days and how people really use the library for the air conditioning. They see more foot traffic um, of folks coming and staying to, to avoid the heat if maybe they don't have air conditioning at home. Have you noticed much of that up um, with the Mystic No Ink Library? Yeah, I think that that is true for libraries in general. I remember uh, when I was in Norwalk, the uh, the announcement started coming around about going to the library because we're open a lot of hours, accessible to people. There's something to do while you're keeping cool. And uh, it does seem to be mostly for air conditioning and not so much heating. Um, and actually it's not all that warm in the library, so. Uh, but uh, but I think in the summer you do see people just coming in to you know escape from the heat. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm curious, Don, if your microphone is working, if those days with really poor air quality, if you saw decreased traffic of folks coming to the marina uh, to work on the boats and get the boats out. Yeah, hopefully you can hear me now. Yep, can hear you um, now. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to do a microphone change. So um, yeah, we uh, we didn't see too much of that uh, impacting our traffic here. Um, you know, people would uh, 
probably more so want to get out on the boats and go offshore or go to a, you know, Fisher's Island or wherever they could, you know, escape that. But, uh, you know, it, uh, it didn't seem to impact us very much other than the sun being sort of blocked and hazy days and, you know, not as spectacular as they should be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm curious for any of the local business owners on the line, um, we're going to talk in a couple of moments about flood insurance. Um, but I'm curious if folks have flood insurance in Mystic for their local businesses. And maybe you could either raise your hand or if you wanted to come off mic. Sorry, off mute. So Don's raising a hand absolutely with a marina. I'd be yeah, sure we we definitely have it. Um, and we're we're mostly impacted by the flooding here. Um, that's probably our biggest challenge. Um, and on your visit, you saw our infrastructure is kind of geared toward dealing with a lot of flooding and high water events. Yeah. Um, the only thing that really impacts us still is the actual, we're kind of special because we have a town road that runs through the middle of us. So, and that is the low lying area. So that's, that's the worst part of what we have to deal with. And it makes our uh, two northernmost docks inaccessible, generally two or three or sometimes five days a month. Um, so that road floods regularly. Uh, and in the December 23rd or 22nd storm, we had three feet of water in that in that road area. So we actually shuttled customers out to the dock by boat. Wow. So it was, uh, yeah, it was, and that happens quite often, even in the summer, but, uh, and the, the flooding is worse in the winter. That's pretty typical, but, um, so that's our biggest challenge. And if folks aren't aware, the Marina has done a tremendous job of preparing for these larger disasters in terms of elevating utilities and having a whole protocol of, of uh, you know, procedure for switching things off and protecting the, the property and all of the boats there. It's um, truly impressive uh, what they've put together. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so with that, let's, um, I'll flip back to a couple more slides talking now about some, some resources for local businesses, um, and then we'll we'll go back to conversation. So just wanted to present like three different sort of types of, of resources that might be helpful to folks. Um, and the first kind of the, the, the quickest and easiest are disaster preparedness checklists. So they say disaster, but they can be really helpful in terms of thinking of impacts of smaller events as well. This is an example, and obviously you can't read it, but I just wanted to show kind of the format of it. This is from the U.S. Small Business Administration. Um, and these things tend to only about, be about two or three pages, but um, they, they can point out some really helpful things to be thinking about in advance. Um, so, you know, and they, and they sort of speak to the many different types of systems that can be impacted by, in this case, flooding. So things like, do you and your staff know where the gas main and electrical shutoffs are? Uh, if you know that you're going to have water in the streets, have you um, called up any of your providers to postpone deliveries? developing emergency communications chains to make sure that you have a kind of a quick and easy way to contact your staff as well as get messages out to customers if you're going to be shut down due to um, you know flooding at, at the business. A lot of recommendations as well about backing up and physically protecting files and technology. So using things like the cloud to make sure that you have copies of materials online, but then also physically, you know, wrapping things in plastic and putting them in bins and making sure that you label the bins with the name of your business um, and putting them up high. Uh, safety considerations as well after flood events to make sure that, um, you know, folks are, folks are, understanding of all of the different threats and um, and able to move through the area and then handle materials safely. It's really important. Um, so again, these you can read it in five minutes and I think it, they give a lot of good food for thought for the, a lot of the different dynamics um, that 
come into play when you do have flooding in a local business. Second resource we wanted to share are these booklets from the state of Rhode Island. They are climate change resources for business. And they have, uh, as you can see, kind of a handful of them, and they're all sector specific. These are about 14 to 16 pages long, so not too long, uh, but a little bit of a read. Um, but I think they've done a really great job at, at making them pretty dynamic. So the next slide here I have, and obviously you can't read that material, but I wanted to give you screenshots to show how they've presented information in different ways. So on the left, they have an infographic that points out a number of key aspects of a business that could be disrupted during a flood event. In the middle, they have a checklist that people can look at to identify where their business might have vulnerabilities, but also what their strengths are. And then the image on the right, and I think this might be the most valuable part of these guides, are they have a couple of pages all about insurance. And they have questions that local business owners can be asking their insurance agents. So really, I think um, you can directly kind of lift that information and call up your agent and, and use the guided questions they have um, just to make sure there's not assumptions about what is and is not covered. They explain some of the differences between typical insurance and flood insurance. Um, and things about the claim process. So again, I think really, really helpful advice to make sure that local businesses are appropriately covered for these climate related disasters. Um, and then the last resource we wanted to share, and, and this is the most kind of comprehensive, is business continuity planning. So the image on the left, there's a, this is the cover page of a template from FEMA. There are other examples of these uh, online. Ready.gov has one as well. And um, with business continuity planning, it's all about putting pen to paper to really write down all of the kind of foundations of your business and doing some planning ahead to really preserve your business's value and assets. And so these do take some time to develop. Um, but I think during, you know, the time of chaos, when there has been an impact, maybe you have a large flood, these plans help give you a really strong resource to be able to look at and say, okay, these are the decisions we already made and now we get to put them in action as opposed to operating from, you know, a place where you're grappling with the reality of what's happened and the emotions of what have happened and a lot of uncertainties, you know, having this guide and having done some of that planning beforehand can really help with communication and making sure that you're making um, kind of, you know, the the best businesses that or decisions to help your business get back up and running. Oh, sorry. Sometimes our server refreshes and screens pop up. So want to highlight a couple of next steps before we go back into conversation. Um, so as I mentioned, we are building out the resiliency action recommendations for the downtown mystic plan. And we are definitely wanting to include recommendations of what the town as well as our partners can be doing to help support mystics, local businesses and, and economy. Um, one of the things that we are interested in doing this summer is actually bringing an intern on board to help local businesses with this. So the University of New Hampshire, UNH, has a summer fellow program and we, the town has had uh, fellows through this program a couple of times in the past and they're with us for 10 weeks and we carve out a project for them and then they're kind of off and running 10 weeks, that's, that's their main focus. And so we just submitted a proposal to UNH to get an intern this summer who would be specifically available to work with local businesses on any of the resources I just showed or others. So maybe it's talking more with local businesses about that issue of, okay, do we have access to sandbags and what would that look like um, if the town were able to put something in place to make these really readily accessible? Maybe it's walking through some of those checklists with local business owners to, um, you know, help provide essentially a free service, a little extra bandwidth to get some of those um, actions in place. So we have our fingers crossed. We'll find out in a couple of weeks if we were successful. But, you know, wanting to kind of take that first step of providing some extra bandwidth uh, for both the town and hopefully local business owners as well to, to be moving the needle on some of this preparation. 
And I also want to highlight the pivot grant. So this is something that the town has funded out of our ARPA money. ARPA is American Rescue Plan Act, and that was the federal COVID relief dollars. So the pivot grant can provide up to $5,000 for eligible businesses to enhance operations, revamp strategies, and navigate the ever-changing business landscape effectively. And there's a wide range of things that the funding can support. Um, from upgrading infrastructure to investing in technical assistance. And all of this really is, again, to help build the resilience of our business community. Those grants, the applications are open now through November 30th. So if you've not heard of it, please take a look. We have a website up on Greater Groton. So um, you can go to the Greater Groton main page and look for the Pivot Grant Square or go to greatergroton.com backslash pivot. So with that, and we have about 14 minutes left, just wanted to open it back up for conversation. I'm curious to hear from local business owners if the resources we just shared are something that you've already used or are using, if you have ideas or suggestions for what the town could do as those resiliency action recommendations, um, if there are special topics of interest that you'd like to know more about, we'd be happy to hold additional sessions. It would be great to know what those topics might be. Um, so any of those uh, sorts of items of feedback, we would love to hear from you. And may maybe Maggie to help grease the wheels a little bit. Do you want to chime in on what the Alliance is hoping to do around this topic? I know you mentioned hoping to convene like a working group to continue this type of discussion moving forward. Yes, I would love to. Um, <clears throat> so for those who don't know, the Alliance for the Mystic River Watershed is um, working to put together a comprehensive watershed plan, which will not only be a repository of data um, but also be actively a resiliency um, partnership connecting four towns and two tribal nations in the watershed to work together on mitigating the impacts of extreme weather. And so within that uh, development of the plan, which is really community owned, um, we are setting up working groups to take deep dives into specific areas or sectors in our watershed. And one of those is a working group focusing on resilient business and um, eco-wise development. And so we would love to invite all of you to continue um, this discussion uh, to really work hard at uh, looking at all kinds of solutions that are achieved collaboratively. So how what what's possible when we're working together and then um, strategically applying for grants together to help us to achieve those. Um, so anyway, I'm I'm applauding everything that is uh, that Groton is doing. Um, they're really laying the foundation, uh, but I think that all of this work will be enhanced when we're working together. Um, across all of the, the businesses and both of the towns on both sides of the drawbridge, but also upstream. <clears throat> so anyway, I'm inviting everybody to join and bring your friends to this working group. Thanks, Maggie. If there was a way for me to put in links, I would do it, but maybe if you just, maybe Bruce and Megan, you can help with that. Yeah, and I'm happy to share links for some of the resources that I had shown in an email to folks afterwards. So Maggie, if you want to email me the links you'd like to include, I'd be happy to add those to the list. Great. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, and I think what Maggie said highlights an important aspect um, that I want to make clear. You know, we are developing this plan for Downtown Mystic, but when the plan is completed, that's really when the work begins, right? So uh, continuing the conversations continuing how we are partnering together to really put resilience into action is something that I take very seriously in my role with the town. And so appreciative of the Alliance and all the partners that are here today that, you know, can help work with us on all of these ideas. And Paige, if I, if I may say, I'm sorry, one more quick thing, mm -hmm. um, especially because there are folks here who are 
from uh, government uh, agencies. And um, I think that all of the towns are very interested in finding out how town governance can play a role here in helping to support businesses to become more resilient. And so like if there are regulatory things that need to happen or be updated, um, then that's part of this discussion as well. Paige, did you want to weigh in? Yes, yeah, just a couple things. Um, I, I just wanted to commend today's program. Um, small businesses have been challenged for a while. COVID definitely uh, increased that, but they were challenged even before. And I think when local government can reach out and try to provide assistance and resources, that is really the main role that we should be doing rather than just saying, here's the data, we're in trouble. Well, how can local government be proactive? And that's what Megan, you're, you're offering, and I think the checklist and fellow and other grant funding, trying to bridge that gap when there are challenges is definitely critical. Second thing I wanted to say regarding that pivot grant that you referenced, um, that is a, a broad business assistance grant program. Um, if businesses have a need to increase online presence or building facades or certainly everything that was mentioned to assist them with um, flooding or other hazards. Um, that is something we're interested in. We have limited funding. Uh, there's a good chance we might extend that November 30th deadline. If people have any questions, uh, have them reach out to either me, Sam Eisenbeiser. Um, we're more than happy to have a conversation and try to help businesses. Fantastic. Thanks, Paige. It looks like uh, Jim O'Donnell, would you like to come on mic? Yeah, thanks. I, I, I would like to hear um, uh, why businesses aren't having getting insurance. Are there not products that are useful or is it too expensive or they didn't think about it? Great question. It's too hard for this early, huh? <laughs> yeah, I think that topic is something that, you know, we could potentially dive into um, through some additional outreach and really try to understand, do do businesses in Mystic have flood insurance because flooding is such an ever present issue here? Or, you know, it, it was interesting doing the field surveys because we talked with some people who were like, yeah, it floods and we have water in my store all the time. Like we're in Mystic. That's the price of being in Mystic. But then we talked to some others who were like, oh, you know, we're, we're up just a little bit higher. So it really hasn't been a problem for us. Um, and that might be changing. So I'd be curious to know if those businesses have put flood insurance in place or because they haven't been directly impacted yet if they've not. Um, so that might be a whole separate topic that we look to dive into um, as we start implementing the plan. Any last comments, suggestions or ideas? Robert. Yes, hi. I'm just <clears throat> wondering if there's an effort to um, offer grants or loans for flood proofing or distribute more information to business owners related to um, taking those steps and the support that uh, the state um, or even the town can provide for that. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, the town's been looking a little and Dave's on the line here into community rating system, which is an entire program through the federal government where if the town does certain actions, um, you can actually get cost savings on on insurance premiums. Um, 
And some of those actions around are around support to the business community and making sure that those resources are shared and having more of these types of outreach events. Um, so whether it's CRS or it's just continuing to work towards a more resi resilient mystic, I think having those resources freely available, be trying to hit the streets with them, make sure people are aware of how those work and what is out there um, will be something that's really critical. I'd love to see if you know if the EDC is is interested in that if if that's worth a, a further conversation too. Yeah, we'd we'd love to. If there's some um, way we could add value by hosting um, some sort of a a public forum where we can discuss and focus on uh, let business owners and the community know what kind of resources are available to do some prevention, we'd be happy to do that. I I think that could be valuable. I'd love to talk to you more about that. Absolutely, I'm excited about that. Okay. Any last uh, comments or questions? I just want to say thanks to everybody for uh, coming. And uh, Megan, thank you for uh, calling us and um, organizing this and the town of Rotten as well. Great. And thanks so much uh, to you and your yes, staff. For all, you. all right. Well, take care, everyone. Thank you so much for sharing your thank time you. this morning. Thank we you. appreciate it. Thank you.